that it's baked into our, our culture as a state. It's been with us for some time. And we're going to do everything we can to make sure that uh, we, um, we impact those rates uh, significantly. Uh, we also, um, as we know, we, we inherit a PFD that was no longer following the formula. We'll talk about uh, the amount of the PFD today as well. The, the PFD passed today is probably the biggest PFD in history, even though it falls short of the formula that uh, is still in statute. We also are eliminating off our books uh, oil tax credits. Uh, about, uh, we inherited about $800 million in oil tax credits. Uh, under this budget, all those, uh, all those oil tax credits will be paid off and will be removed from the books. We, um, we also inherited uh, savings accounts that didn't have much in them. This particular budget will put a significant amount of money into savings. Uh, at least $1.7 billion of deposits into the CBR. We have endowments that are now uh, have, have money in them. We're going to uh, forward, forward fund, forward pay education. So we take that off the table so next year we can talk about policies and not just, uh, not just money. Uh, we're going to have over $3 billion uh, as a balance in the CBR. As we know, we have a lot of work to do, just like we do in public safety. Uh, we have a lot of work to do in education. We, um, uh, we passed a significant, I think, a landmark bill this year, and we joined the rest of the states in this country that believe that reading has to be a priority for our kids. And um, again, the, uh, that, that particular bill will uh, we'll have the resources behind it to make sure that um, we begin the journey of making sure that every one of our kids can read at grade level. Um, we also, uh, as we mentioned, we have a, a windfall that we're going to transfer to Alaskans. And so this is something I just want to mention. Years ago, about uh, 2008 or so, we had an increase in oil prices in the state of Alaska. Went up to about $150 a barrel, if you remember. But we also had production back then that was significantly more than it is today. And why do I bring that up? Because um, we were in a bit of a recession during that time. And so you didn't have really an inflationary period like we do today. So today we have inflation. And today, the windfall is really coming off of the price of oil, not necessarily the production like it did back then. And so as a result of that, we recognize that. And we believe that uh, Alaska, the state of Alaska, has a responsibility to help its people. Um, the PFD is going to significantly assist with that, but also our municipalities and our taxpayers. So you'll see where we, uh, we fully fund uh, our bond debt reimbursement for our municipalities. This is going to be a transfer back to the, um, back to the municipalities. And we, we hope that that translates into, uh, hopefully, to some degree, uh, tax relief for taxpayers in our municipalities. Um, as mentioned, we've been able to save a significant amount. We'll talk about that in more detail. And um, we, uh, we're going to be assisting uh, local uh, governments as well. Are we ready? We have a little slideshow for you here over to the left. So, Savings overall uh, is about $3.6 billion, so 1.7 in the uh, deposit into the um, CBR. We're going to forward fund education uh, to the tune of $1.2 billion. Uh, higher education, when, and we're going to talk about that in a moment, and we're going to talk about things like our investments in drones and heavy oil and critical uh, minerals up at the university, which I think is significant and important uh, given that we're trying to uh, make sure that uh, we can crack our heavy oil issue, but at the same time make sure that uh, Alaska stays on the map as a premier mining place as well. And we become the uh, drone capital of the United States is what our uh, goal is with the University of Alaska. Um, and then uh, money going into the permanent fund is roughly $900 million. That will go into the permanent fund as well. Again, our PFD is going to be uh, uh, roughly $3,200, which um, by some estimates is the largest uh, PFD to date. This is all being done with no new taxes, no new taxes in this budget, no new taxes were proposed um, under this administration. We talked about public safety. Uh, we repealed SB 91. We have gone from 314 uh, active troopers in 2018 to 355 today. Uh, active VPSOs at the same date, 45 and 18 and 55 today. We're going to be investing in VPSO housing. Uh, we are funding 10 new VPSO positions. We are funding a new tribal liaison to assist with our, um, uh, our public safety issues. And uh, 
We have a uh, new missing and murdered indigenous persons director, Ann Sears, who's behind me today and will speak in a moment. Uh, Ann was a uh, state trooper for a very long time before she retired and uh, came over to work on this particular project, which is, which is important to a lot of folks. We have a significant capital budget that will invest in roads, bridges, ports, harbors, airports, and ferry systems. As we mentioned on education, uh, we've got a reading bill that uh, for the first time really uh, demands accountability from everybody, uh, including school districts. Uh, the state has a responsibility. And uh, we, are, we are pretty excited that uh, this is going to lead to uh, better reading scores and better educational uh, outcomes overall. Um, this, uh, there's, a, there's an increase to the BSA in this budget. We also have one-time funds to help school districts offset some of the high inflationary costs, the energy costs. And um, we, as mentioned, we are, we're putting uh, 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 $33 million into the University of Alaska research programs. What does this budget do for rural Alaska? Uh, it uh, once again puts money into education for rural Alaska. We are going to fund uh, a, a school in the Pakiak. It was for approximately $54 million. The school is in dire need of replacement for the kids out there. This funds PCE, and just a reminder, folks, uh, this administration has funded PCE actually every single year, and that's the same, uh, same this year. There's going to be about $117 million going in for uh, village safe water. Uh, we set up a broadband office to assist with all the monies coming in from the federal government to make sure that that broadband money is handled in a manner consistent with what the people of Alaska uh, view on how broadband should be uh, 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 put in place in the state of Alaska. This is a massive undertaking. We um, also funded an infrastructure navigator grant to the Alaska Federation of Natives for the purpose of helping tribes uh, to be able to uh, work with them on things like broadband and other uh, grant projects. We're looking at about $268 million for our airports as well. And we're going to put uh, uh, over $2 million into ice roads in some of our rural communities. These ice roads are significant in helping our rural communities uh, lower the cost of goods and services in the wintertime when many of our rivers can actually be turned into temporary highways. And uh, the folks in those uh, parts of the state truly take advantage of that situation, and we want to assist with that so we can help lower the cost. So a lot of this budget is in savings. A lot of this budget is put into endowments. Um, as a matter of fact, we're saving enough money and we're endowing enough and forward funding education that if the price of oil dropped dramatically, even into the 20s, it's our estimate that uh, we could actually, through these savings and these endowments and forward funding, uh, fund, uh, fund our budget for another year. So it's significant. Um, again, as mentioned, we have uh, muni tax relief, bond debt reimbursement that uh, we hope brings relief to the taxpayer in the boroughs and the municipalities, property taxpayers. And um, as mentioned, um, we also reduced the spending from this budget by about $400 million. Much of that was above and beyond what was requested by, um, by the administration or by um, uh, a certain, uh, certain entities that uh, had worked with the administration to uh, get uh, items in the, in the budget. We paid off our oil tax credits, as mentioned, with $390 million. So that's off the books. We don't have to worry about that again. So that's, not a, that's a pay we don't have to worry about in the future. Our, bow, our, our borrowing power, what we can borrow, uh, went from 300 million in 219 to now, it's up to 1.3 billion. Uh, so when it comes to bonds, the ability for us to bond has increased dramatically because we've paid down some of those bonds. Our credit ratings uh, have improved from negative in 2019 to either stable or positive today. And um, with the exception of investments in public safety and education, all of our agencies are at uh, uh, levels below when we came in in 2019, so we've kept spending in check in much of our operating side of the budget. So again, uh, this budget pays a, a uh, you know, historic PFD, uh, it puts a lot of money into savings, pays things forward, takes uh, debt off the books, improves our debt rating. Um, we are able to invest in the uh, areas of uh, the government that I think most people believe we should be, and that's public safety, uh, that's education, that's research, it's, uh, it's infrastructure. And so our view is that this is a, 
uh, a responsible budget given what, uh, uh, given our, our current situation with our, our uh, funding from, uh, and our revenue from oil. It uh, keeps people first with regard to a PFB, with regard to, regard to a property tax um, relief and helps municipalities as well with community assistance. And so all in all, I think it, uh, I think it, it, it hits all of the major points that a budget should hit. Um, again, no new taxes to, to, uh, to make this budget work, lots of savings and lots of investment in the state of Alaska. So with that, I'm gonna ask that the mayor of the great city of Anchorage come forward and say a few words about uh, a, a major infra infrastructure project happening in his city. Thank you, Governor. Thanks for having me here today. Thank you, everyone, for attending. I want to start off by thanking Governor Dunleavy and the Alaska Legislature for their collaboration on securing $200 million in the budget for the Port of Alaska, which we're about to name the uh, Don Young Port of Alaska. Without state support, we'd be looking at sky-high tariffs on all the goods and services and food that come through our port. My numbers, people tell me tariffs, which is basically a tax, would go up by nearly 900% if we had to foot the entire bill uh, at the muni municipal level. And I simply can't let that happen. And I'm grateful that the governor, uh, that Governor Dunleavy and the Alaska legislature agrees in this. This money will be used for the design and permitting for, the car for cargo terminal one phase. This is crucial when it comes to food security, security for the entire state of Alaska. You have heard this statistic before, but 90% of the people of Alaska uh, get their food and services over the port of Alaska. And this budget for the port shows an investment to protect that. The port of Alaska is Alaska's supply chain and economic lifeline, and I'm glad that we've got the support from the governor and the legislature uh, for that. This is cer certainly a statewide effort. So thank you very much, and thank you, Governor. Thanks. Uh Thanks, Mayor Bronson. So next we're going to have uh, Ann Sears come up. And once again, Ann is our uh, murdered and missing and mur missing and murdered indigenous woman uh, uh, investigator that we've taken on to deal with that issue. And so, Ann, you want to come up and say a few words, please? Thank you, Governor. Thank you, everybody. My name is Ann Sears. As the governor said, I am the investigator for missing or murdered indigenous people. Um, I am working for the Alaska State Troopers in this position. Through the investigation, uh, a thorough investigation of murders or missing persons involving Alaska Natives is a top priority. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> is a top priority for the state of Alaska and for the Alaska Department of Public Safety. Alaskans should have faith that their law enforcement agencies will investigate crimes regardless of race, religion, nationality, gender, zip code, or any other circumstance, and my position is evidence of that. Since starting in April, we have made progress on two cold case uh, homicides involving Alaska Natives. While I cannot go into any details yet, we are still, as we are still finishing the investigations, please know that we will hold, these, hold those responsible for these violent acts accountable. I am also looking into and making headway on several other unresolved homicides that have been referred to me. I have attended a variety of meetings with Alaska Native organizations, including several regional public safety summits, the first Alaskans Institute for, Mis uh, for Missing or Murdered Indigenous Persons Tribunal, and participated in several Missing or Murdered Indigenous Peoples remembrances and rallies to help bridge the gap between law enforcement and our vibrant Alaska Native communities. I have spent a lot of time on the phone and in person with the loved ones of Alaska Natives that are missing or murdered, providing updates on our investigations and, and taking in new information about their cases. I've had families and friends reach out by email as well, telling me about their missing or murdered loved ones. I'm not doing this alone, as it takes hundreds of troopers and professional staff to help provide public safety in Alaska, including investigating MMIP cases. As a 20 plus year Alaska State Trooper, having served in both rural and urban Alaska, I have never seen a financial investment in our department and mission as large as the one as the governor and the legislature is providing in this budget. 
It invests by adding troopers, borough-based investigators, VPSOs, and professional staff across the state. It invests in our aircraft and vessel fleets to ensure that troopers can respond to our smallest communities without delay. It funds major crimes investigators, crime scene technicians, two deputy fire marshals, tribal liaisons, and victim witness coordinators in Western Alaska to improve communications and public safety outcomes across the region. A criminal justice technician was also added to work in the missing persons clearinghouse along with the manager. This budget, without a doubt, will save lives across our state. Thank you for having me today, Governor. It's been an honor. And thanking, thank you for making these meaningful, meaningful investments in public safety in Alaska. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Um, before we uh, introduce our next guest, I want, to, uh, I want to thank our men and women in blue. I want to thank our police officers, both uh, troopers, local police officers across the board. Um, they, uh, they do a tremendous job. It was about a week and a half ago, uh, a week ago, that uh, we had a trooper that was actually shot while performing duty in uh, Fairbanks. I spoke with him yesterday. He's doing well. And, uh, uh, you know, our thoughts and prayers are with him. But um, I just want to thank you all. I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you for what you do. And um, uh, as I mentioned this, um, you know, what you do allows us to live the life that uh, we live. And uh, when you do your job as well as you do, it's an afterthought that we have police looking out for us. So, again, Ann, I want to thank you for, um, for uh, retiring and coming back on board. Uh, and I want to thank all of, our, all of our police, all of our law enforcement across the state of Alaska. Um, one other thing I want to make uh, mention of that I almost left out is uh, I want to thank uh, Brian Butcher with HFC, who's in the audience here today, because uh, there is going to be uh, uh, millions of dollars put into place to help with housing in rural Alaska for our uh, police, our VPSOs, uh, and other professionals uh, it's very difficult in many parts of uh, rural Alaska to find housing for folks uh, for a whole host of reasons, the cost, et cetera. But again, I'm, 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 uh, I want to thank Brian for the ability to work with AHFC to be able to meet some of these needs. And you're going to see some, uh, some building out there that's going to take care of some of our uh, needs with regard to our professionals that we, we just mentioned. So next, I'd like to have uh, the, the um, superintendent of the Anchorage School District, uh, Dina Parham will come up and say a few words about education, hopefully the Reading Act. Good afternoon. My name is Dina Bishop. What you? My oh, former I'm name. Sorry. I'm sorry. That's, all right. That's okay. <laughs> Truly, I am humbled and honored to have the opportunity to speak to the Alaska Reads Act. I have been an Alaskan educator for over 30 years, serving communities, students, families, and our educators. This legislation is critical. It speaks to my passion as an educator. Believe it or not, I am a math teacher and reading's number one fan. I have seen the anguish and discouragement in students that struggle due to the lack of reading skill acquisition. I often say in my office, when we know better, we should do better. Alaska, we know better. The reading wars are settled. The research is clear that student achievement is directly linked to reading ability. We understand the need to employ the science of reading. This legislation provides a focus a shared goal as Alaskans. This bill provides funding and access for our earliest learners in pre-K. It supports educators by providing high quality professional development as well as curriculum as needed. And in this digital age, the Alaska Reads Act supports our in-person as well as distant learners. I strongly believe that reading competency for all children will build the future of Alaska. Our democracy, our economy, our communities, large and small. Importantly, and most importantly, it'll bring the hope and success to our young people. Alaska, we have the opportunity to do better. 
thank you for the selfless bipartisan efforts of Alaska lawmakers, educators, reading advocates, and our families. Today is a day to celebrate. This too will save lives. Not learning to read is a life sentence. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to our partners in post-secondary, Regent Scott Jepson and Regent Ralph Seekins. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. On behalf of the Board of Regents, we want to express our appreciation to the legislature and the governor for their support of the university system as demonstrated in this budget. The budget provides financial stability for the UA system, essential for universities to focus on key state needs and to address student demand for accessible, affordable, and high quality education. So let me give you a couple of examples of how the budget does this. First, there's an $8 million increase in our base operating costs. This represents a turning point for financial stability for UAF, UAA, and UAS. This is key to attracting uh, talent for our university's uh, professors and to establishing really the this basis of stability that brings uh, students to the university and is key to our success. The funding provides a 2% increase for staff salaries and helps retain high quality employees. The fixed cost increase also supports cybersecurity, property insurance, maintenance, and the extraordinary inflationary increases facing all organizations. Now, of course, inflationary uh, pressures aren't going to stop. The university is going to be looking at cost uh, efficiencies, reallocations, and other revenue sources to help us meet our funding requirements. The uh, budget also reconstitutes the Higher Education Investment Fund. Uh, HB 322, uh, is passed by the legislature, provides for the stability for the Higher Investment Education Fund, and the appropriation that was approved by the governor reconstitutes that fund at the level it would have been in its previous reincarnation, uh, accounting for market losses that we've seen over the last uh, month or so, the last couple of months. The HEIF is critical for Alaska students in the sense that it provides post-secondary education financial aid for about 5,400 Alaska students. So this is uh, very important for them to plan for their uh, education and the financing of that education. There are a couple of other areas that the budget supports the university system as well as the economy of Alaska. It supports it in some one-time funding for some research projects and also for some key infrastructure projects for the university. And I'll turn it over to uh, Ralph Seekins to talk for a few minutes about those. Thank you, Scott. I'm Ralph Seekins from Fairbanks. You know, it's been my pleasure over the years. I think I've worked with and had the opportunity to meet many in, in, of the governor, from Governor Egan on up through Governor Dunleavy. As a member of the Board of Regents, I, I've really been impressed with the fact that we, on multiple occasions we've been able to sit down with the governor, talk about things that would help us to have a better, more efficient, and better uh, high quality education for the people, for the students in the University of Alaska. One of the largest geographical universities in the world. Uh, we cover just the three major campuses and all around the state. Big challenges out there for us, just like others. Scott talked about some of the research projects that we're funding in this budget, and uh, they're very important. And these kind of came out of discussions again with the governor and the Board of Regents as, as we looked at, okay, where can we use the resources that we have at the university for the benefit of the people and the economy of the state of Alaska? And some of these uh, uh, research projects, if you, if you take a look at it, you might think, well, why would we do that in Alaska? But we're very, we're, we're very lucky to be able to do some of this in Alaska. The drone program, we have probably already unmanned aircraft we're, we're approaching one of the best programs in the United States. And in, eventually, as we grow, I think even in the world. And the opportunity is there to use those uh, for many different purposes in the state. And there already is interest in, in taking our technology across the borders into Canada and the rest of the, the, rest of the nation. And those are the things like, like the drone program, uh, mineral programs. We know that in Alaska State there are... Uh, virtually every mineral for industry and defense, but we've got to get the infrastructure to get there. So we're going to look at some of the research on that as well. Um, we, uh, uh, we, we, we would have those programs because, again, we're sitting down with the governor and saying, here's where we can use these and what we can do together. And we appreciate the fact that those are in, there, in our program. 
we also have some deferred maintenance programs. Deferred maintenance, of course, as you all know, is a big thing everywhere. We, when you own buildings and you own property, you got to keep them going. And uh, in this budget, there's $23 million for the renovations on the Moore Bartlett Hall in, at the University in, in Fairbanks. And another, I think, $20 million on something that's sorely needed, and that's to upgrade our IT system all across the whole university system, not just in any one particular campus, for the benefit of being able to have a modern system for use used in, the IT, in, in, in our IT system at, at the University of Alaska. These are just a couple of the areas, but I want to say that we, uh, as we look at it, um, I think... Uh, the legislature, the governor working with them, working with us, uh, we've come up with some, some great strides forward in a university system. We've come into an area of stability and an area of progress. And if you look at the research side of the University of Alaska, it's one of the best in the world already. And with the help of the governor and, and the legislature, I think we can make it even better. And so I want to thank you very much for that. Appreciate that. Um, I uh, kind of skipped around a little bit, but I'm, next I want to go to Julie Kitka with AFN to talk about uh, some of the uh, some of the work that uh, we've partnered on with uh, Navigator Project. Well, thank you, Governor. Uh, my name is Julie Kitka, and I have the honor of serving as the president of the Alaska Federation of Natives. For those of you not familiar with AFN, as we represent the indigenous people in Alaska, it's the largest membership organization. We make up nearly 20% of the state population. We reside in every corner of the state. We're the largest private landowners in the state. And we're very highly, highly organized, whether or not our federally recognized tribes, our tribal consortium, our tribal health system, our tribal housing, our uh, village corporations and regionals. And I'm just really pleased to tell you that we've been working really closely with the governor and his administration on bridging some of the divides and building these partnerships. And I wanted to use the Navigator program as an example of that. We have had unprecedented levels of federal spending um, pushed out from the Congress and the administration um, to deal with economic recovery from COVID, both as well as the support for uh, COVID relief on that, but in the economic recovery. Uh, the governor's office reached out to us and said, why don't you set up a navigator project and help your people navigate all these agencies and try to capture some of these monies that might escape the state? And so um, they are the ones that approached us. We agreed to that. Our goal was to try to capture $300 million that might have missed the state, and we had six months to do it in a limited amount of time. And at the end of the six months, we touched $771 million, or three-quarters of a billion dollars. And we were able to prove to both the federal agencies we're working with, but also to the governor and his team, that we had an effective model for reaching out and bridging that. And so we're, we're really pleased that, that that project has continued and the legislature supported that. It is intended to make sure that no corner of the state is left behind because they don't have the capability to um, qualify or put forward proposals to capture some of these resources. We also talked to the governor's office very closely about the, the um, infrastructure bill that was passed and the fact that there's a $13 billion tribal set aside in that for Native Americans across the country. And so this partnership working with the state to try to compete and capture those resources to build up our communities and our people on that, uh, the partnership with the state is going to be essential in order to do that because most of our tribes are small, small populations scattered there. And how do you compete against the Navajos or the Cherokees with their huge population? So the fact that we'd have the state working with us together on that is going to be really helpful. So I just wanted to give you an example, but that's only one example. I, I see Commissioner Crum there, and I'm really grateful for, for his leadership on what we're doing, as well as Commissioner Johnson and Department of Education. But I could name other ones on that. I've found that the administration is very interested in supporting innovation and trying to stretch the resources further and 
um, tries to have an open mind on that, and that's something we really treasure. We have a sense of urgency on getting things done. A lot of changes going on around in our economy and around our world on that, and we're going to be need to be as innovative and creative thinking as we can, but but build those bridges between the tribes and the federal government and the state, and do this together as opposed to um, you know trying to do it separately. So thank you for the chance to talk this morning. Thanks, Julie. Um, appreciate that. Um, so next, we're going to have uh, Matt Tomter with uh, Matsu Brewery come up and just talk about the impact of the PFD on particularly his business. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thanks uh, for the invite to come here and talk about uh, things that are going great in the state of Alaska. A $3,200 PFD for people all across the state uh, sells a lot of beer. So that's good for us. But I, I, I think you know, the real important thing to see is that money belongs to you as Alaskans. And uh, getting that back out there and helping whatever you need help with, whether you're putting a furnace in your house or you're taking your family to dinner or you're, you're going and buying new clothes, whatever it can be, seek out a small business in your area and spend some money there because our business relies on, on your business. When you're doing good, we're doing good. And this is a great thing to see. Really stoked to see the hard work that went into making that happen, and uh, it's going to Alaskans, and everybody's going to benefit. So cheers. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, so at this point, we're, what we'll do, Jeff, is open it up for questions. Um, and uh, we got folks behind us. If there's questions specific to them, we'll have them come up to the uh, mic. Otherwise, I'll, uh, I'll field them. Governor, so uh, you mentioned earlier that you're forward funding education, and uh, at the start of your term as governor, you actually tried to sue to prevent forward funding of education from happening. I'm wondering, you know, what's changed over the last three years to sort of change your mind as to the prospects of doing that? Great question. So the case actually evolved around not just forward funding, but forward funding without identified resources to fund it. In other words, the idea was that we were going to we were going to say we're going to fund education, but we had no resources to do it. This particular uh, approach to funding has, or forward funding, has not just the idea of forward funding, but the actual resources behind it. We have the money in hand. We have the, the, the uh, surplus in hand to be able to do it. So that's the difference. Okay, our next question comes from Jeff Angle. Thanks. Hey, Governor, uh, when you were elected, you supported a full statutory PFD and then payback. Last year, you came out with many legislators in support of a 50-50 model. And then this year, in March, you came out and said you wanted 3,700. And then the Senate passed 5,500, and you encouraged the House to concur, which they almost did. I guess there was a deal about cutting the rebate to 4,200. Now it's 3,200 because half of the 650 failed. Do you support a full PFD, a 50-50 PFD, or a variable PFD? And do you think it's unfair? for Alaskans every year to have these numbers just wildly uh, change. Yeah, I do. I do, Jeff. I think it's unfair. And again, um, the uh, the formula that was in, uh, was working for almost 30 some, almost 40 years uh, was ended, was broken in the previous administration. So the legislature, the people of Alaska, and, and I have been trying to figure out a way to get this back on its feet, get this PFD back where it was. Because currently, as you know, we have two statutes, SB 26 and the current formula that's been in existence for decades. What I proposed was, I had said to the legislature last year, if we want to send to the people a 50-50 dividend uh, change in the statute, we do that also with a constitutional amendment. In other words, the people of Alaska get the opportunity to decide if they want a 50-50 to be able to... Uh, uh, fix this issue and, and have a uh, have, a, have a formula going forward. So I still stand by what I believe in, and that is that the people of Alaska, if there's going to be any changes to the statute, the people of Alaska have to be involved in that. So that was the purpose of that. So you're right; it's all over the map. It shouldn't be all over the map. It should have followed the statute. If not, we need to change the statute. But when we change the statute, the people of Alaska need to be part of that through a constitutional amendment, and that's what the 50-50 was. So you're right. One minute was $5,400. Uh, a while ago, it was $1,000 all over the place. We have to get back to where we follow the laws, and the purpose of putting that forward was to get the people of Alaska to decide if they want to make a change or if they don't. 
I would uh, any change to the any change to the PFD, if the people of Alaska get an opportunity to vote on that, I've been consistent. That's why there was a constitutional amendment introduced by myself to do that very thing. It was also a constitutional amendment to put sideboards and in, in, uh, reframe our spending limit as well. And so I have a lot of faith in the people of Alaska to be able to help solve these issues. Specifically, I noticed that there were several vetoes of recruitment and retention bonuses for state employees, and I'm wondering if you're concerned at all about the ability to recruit and retain uh, quality employees in the state. Uh, we are. I think everybody is. So those vetoes, those vetoes occurred because there's other means now through bills that were passed to be able to help pay for those folks. In other words, you would have had two, uh, two different approaches to help underwrite uh, pay for the folks. So we only needed the bills that were passed. So therefore, we didn't need the appropriations that the extra appropriations that were put in there. So you will see you will see raises for some of our folks uh, in state government through the bill process. Okay, now we're going to take some questions from reporters online. For the reporters online, if you don't have your phone muted, please do so until I call your name. Uh, let's go ahead and start the in Juno with. Could you explain the scope of school bond debt reimbursement funding in this budget? Uh, yeah. Do we have Neil here? Neil, you want to come up and just give the details on that? Thank you. Neil Steinger, uh, Director of the Office of Management and Budget. So the total of school bond debt reimbursement in this budget is back pay of $220 million for um, school bond debt reimbursement that was not fully paid in prior years, as well as another about $80 million for a total of just over $300 million in school bond debt reimbursement going out to communities. And again, the idea behind that is we have a windfall that we got off the backs of Alaskans. When we didn't have money, when I first came in, we had a $1.6 billion deficit. This is an opportunity to transfer some of that wealth back to the people of Alaska through their municipalities through the bond debt reimbursement. Uh, we didn't uh, cut anything. Come on up. Um, so again, Neil Sanger, at the time the legislature passed the budget um, several weeks ago, revenue estimates were lower than they are today. On June 15th, the Department of Revenue released new revenue estimates that allows for full forward funding of K-12 education, as well as an additional surplus that will go into the Constitutional Budget Reserve in the form of savings. So to, be, so to be clear, we didn't cut anything to do the forward funding. Okay, and our next question comes from Mark Sabatini with the Juno Empire. Mark? Hi, can you uh, discuss uh, the thoughts uh, behind the uh, vetoing of uh, the school maintenance funds? That was a fairly significant amount, and deferred maintenance, of course, is something uh, that is a concern that to a great number of uh, entities across the state. Uh, sure. So we have we have a considerable amount of money put into the uh, the maintenance funds, uh, millions of dollars. And um, again, you'll see some vetoes in this budget. Actually, you'll see about four hundred million dollars in vetoes in this budget because again, although we have a windfall and we're making transfers to the f uh, people of Alaska and investments in Alaska, we also want to make sure that we're holding back enough money that in case oil does drop, which it does occasionally, it doesn't always go up, that we have money in the um, uh, in savings and retained for the purpose of being able to continue uh, uh, running government. So this budget's for next year, but we've also have enough money in savings, endowments, and retaining through uh, reducing some of the spending that was proposed by the legislature in an effort to make sure that if, uh, if oil goes down in price, 
we're able to continue to fund gov government for a year after this as well. Okay, and uh, another friendly reminder to the reporters online, if you don't have your phone muted, please do so. You're creating a little feedback on the line and making it hard for your colleagues to hear what the governor and the other speakers are saying. So let's go to James Burke with the Alaska Beacon. Hi there. Looking at historical numbers from legislative finance and whatnot, I understand that there might be some wiggle room numbers still, but it looks like this will be the sixth largest overall budget in state's history. And I'm curious about whether that should be any hard for us, given where the state's been over the past few years. So the, all of our agencies, with the exception of public safety and education, we actually spend less on those agencies uh, than we did when we first got into office. So uh, again, the spend you're looking at really is one time, whether it's uh, bond debt reimbursement and payback to transfer funds to the municipalities, given the fact that we're in an uncertain world right now, inflationary rates, et cetera, uh, employment issues, labor issues. Uh, we also have, a, a, as we mentioned, a historic PFD, which is a transfer. It's not an ongoing spend for state government. We've put a, uh, a considerable amount of money in savings and endowments. Uh, uh, from an accounting perspective, some of that is considered spend when in fact it's savings. And so when you really look at this budget, with the exception of public safety, which I said as when I ran when I was a candidate, that we were going to make sure that uh, we gave our, uh, our public safety officials and, and workers uh, uh, the resources needed to combat crime, and with the exception of uh, education with uh, looking at the Reads Act, for example, all the other agencies are less than in terms of spend. The ongoing costs are less than. So lo uh, long story short, James, the one-time spends are there to deal with the uh, transfers of funds to various agencies, individuals, organizations, to deal with the situation that we're in today with the uncertainty and the inflationary costs. But we've also saved a tremendous amount of money, as I mentioned earlier, in which we could actually fund government another year uh, on top of this, even if uh, oil prices, for example, went into the uh, 20s, 30s or 20s. So from that perspective, a lot of savings, uh, a lot of transfers to individuals, one-time transfers to uh, uh, municipalities, entities, et cetera. And uh, no, so I, I don't have heartburn over this because, um, again, we've reduced uh, some of the spending by $400 million and we've saved a considerable, uh, considerable amount of money. Okay, our next question is from Sean Dwyer with Alaska Beacon. Hello, Sean, you have a question? I do, thank you very much. Um, Governor, the, when, you, when you were first in office, the first year you proposed big budget cuts, but a lot of those were rejected by the legislature, by the legislature. In retrospect, are you happy that those were rejected, seeing that the state's fiscal position has improved? So, Sean, my job as governor is to make sure that uh, uh, we introduce a balanced budget. Uh, we introduce a budget that's going to, uh, under the circumstances, the revenue circumstances, are going to, you know, it's going to do its best to meet the needs of Alaskans. Again, we inherited uh, roughly $1.6 billion deficit. When I was running for office in October of that year, oil had hit about $83 a barrel about a month before the election. The view was that we wouldn't have had to make reductions of such magnitude if oil had held, and some predicted it was going to uh, hold. We got into office, and obviously oil dropped, and we had to respond accordingly. So we proposed um, uh, very steep cuts, very, uh, large reductions, in an effort to balance the budget, given the, uh, uh, the statutes that uh, govern uh, what we spend money on. And so in terms of uh, regretting, you know, during my administration, We've had a lot of things thrown at us. We've had budget deficits thrown at us. We've had a virus thrown at us. We've had earthquakes thrown at us. We've had fires thrown at us. We've had aging of ferries thrown at us. These are all part of being a governor, and you deal with it. And sometimes you're uh, dealt a, uh, a less than stellar hand, but you play it. You do the best you can with it. And um, I think when uh, we look at year four that we're in right now, when we look at this budget, we look at our fiscals, we look at where we are uh, in getting through this, uh, this virus, which we've done, I think, pretty well. You look at the earthquake recovery, we did pretty well. 
So I think all in all, um, we're in a lot better shape across the board today than when I first came into office. Thank you. Um, Governor, I, I wanted to ask, you had mentioned at a news conference um, after the session ended that you were looking at a possible uh, change in when the PFE and the energy rebate is distributed. What timeline are you looking at for that? And can you put a finer point on the issue of your position on the PFE? Are you, are you saying that you're, are, are you committed to a, a new law that would be 50 or are you still on the fence on 50-50 or the historic formula? Uh, I'm committed uh, to working with the people of Alaska. And we'll, we'll make proposals to the people of Alaska through constitutional amendments. We've got to get the legislature to uh, not just pass a statute, because as we know, statutes can be ignored. And that's what's happening with the current PFD formula. And so if there's going to be changes or if there's suggested changes, we're okay with the suggested changes as long as the people of Alaska are okay with the suggested changes. That's why we believe a constitutional amendment is important. The, the bottom line is this. You, you can't ignore the people of Alaska in a number of these very important issues that impact them uh, directly. And so uh, my commitment is to continue to serve the people of Alaska to make sure that they are part of the discussions and that we do things with them, not to them. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, so I was just uh, hoping to check in, um, Governor. I am curious to know what is included in this budget that might be able to help uh, with some of the staff shortages that the Alaska Green Highway System has been seeing. They've been pretty severe, um, and it's uh, it's really hurting the system's ability to provide um, good regular service to Southeast Alaska. So we, we know we have labor issues across the board, not just in uh, the ferry system or in state government, private sector in Alaska, and uh, quite frankly, the United States. Um, I'm going to ask Neil to come up and just talk a little bit about uh, some of the funding that's been put into the ferry system. And um, uh, the issue of labor is, is a difficult one that we're all trying to get our arms around, but uh, I'll have Neil come up here and just say a few words on that. Thank you, Governor. Um, so the Alaska Marine Highway System is benefiting this year from a federal grant from the infrastructure bill passed at the federal level. Um, while Alaska's distribution hasn't been determined, we know that we'll be receiving enough money to actually run the maximum schedule possible with the boats we have available and the condition that they're in. Um, so we feel that that gives the resources to the Department of Transportation to manage that marine highway system to its full potential in this budget. Did you have a question? Yes, um, I do. And um, the governor's budget doesn't seem to. Margie, did you have a question? Yes, can you hear me? Go ahead, Margie. Yeah. Actually, the governor's budget doesn't seem to highlight any particular funds that would aid people in the Yukon and Kuskokwim River region who are banned from salmon fishing this year because of the low fish runs, or specifically homeless issues in Anchorage and elsewhere. Um, if, they're not if they're not money budgeted in the state budget, where is the money coming from? What is the state doing to help these people? Thank you. Thanks, Margie. I'm going to have uh, Doug come up and just talk about uh, the relief we're doing with uh, the issues of salmon and where that money's coming from. And I also know that on the homeless issue, that AHFC has been for years uh, assisting in underwriting some of the homeless issues we have with the state of Alaska. But I'm going to let Doug talk about the salmon issues here for a moment. Thank you, Governor. My name is Doug Vincent Lane, Commissioner of Fishing Game. Um, first off, let me say we're very concerned about the run failures we've seen in the Yukon and Kuskokwim River. They're causing significant hardships to the local people, their cultures that they live on and depend upon. So we are taking it seriously. We have invested money through Congress that we got through the Yukon Salmon Treaty 
And we've invested about $1.5 million. We're going to look at a new sonar possibly on the Yukon River. We've invested in community use surveys. We've also invested in doing some radial telemetry to try to better track. The governor's budget does include two pieces of, of money in the capital budget. One is to look at the nearshore marine environments. We found out through some research in the past that the nearshore marine survival is critical towards assessing the run strength of these rivers. And we're going to expand those surveys and continue those into the future. The second piece is we're looking very carefully at bycatch and we're looking at what can be done in terms of looking at the genetic composition of catches along Area M as well as along in the Bering Sea. And third off, to address the immediate issues, those are longer term kind of questions we're answering. We're distributing fish. We started last year. We're re starting that up this year and hopefully get fresh fish out to those people that are desperately in need of, of food for fish for food security reasons. And that money came from a food security uh, a grant to the feds. Yeah, that money came through a food security grant through the federal government. Thank you. that you're going to announce the distribution plan for the PFD soon. So my question to you is, does that mean the energy rebate check could potentially be released earlier than uh, the PFDs scheduled that release in October? Thanks. Yeah, great question. And that's a decision that we're going we're gonna to make here probably in the next week uh, and let folks know exactly how that, um, how that uh, PFD money is going to be distributed and when. So, so anyway, I want to thank everyone for coming here. Again, um, this is a budget that uh, saves a tremendous amount of money, uh, has a historic high PFD of $3,200. I mean, for a family of five, that's $16,000. That's going to go a long way to help with uh, a number of expenses that I'm sure people are incurring uh, across the board. We do this with no new taxes. There are no new taxes uh, in this budget. We've, uh, we, do this, uh, we do this also with historic investments in public safety. Uh, a, a, a considerable, uh, robust capital budget uh, to take care of ports, bridges, work on the ferry system, uh, harbors, roads, and this will put people to work as well. As mentioned, we invest in education. Uh, this is going to add certainty. And I, I, this, this budget, really what this budget does is it adds certainty to an otherwise uncertain world that we're in right now. Whether it's inflation, whether folks are looking at a war overseas, whether it's labor issues, um, a lot of folks are wondering what the future is going to look like. That all went into this budget. We wanted to make sure that we could transfer money to folks and municipalities uh, through bond debt reimbursement. We wanted to make sure that uh, 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 folks had a, uh, a PFD that, um, although not the statutory PFD that we were working on, but one, uh, one that's at a historic high to be able to help with some of the uncertainty that's in their personal lives. We wanted to interject certainty in our public safety to make sure that they have the resources and that the people of Alaska feel safe. Um, we, uh, we want to inject public, or excuse me, uh, um, certainty into our capital budgets so that people know that we're building Alaska and putting people to work. We want to inject certainty in our education that we do believe that our education system can be better. We do believe that kids can learn. Uh, and also that teachers know that uh, they'll have a contract and that superintendents and principals and, uh, and other staff will know that they have uh, the funds there to do the job. This gives us an opportunity next year to talk about some of the policy issues surrounding education. How do we improve education? So this gives us a, uh, a real opportunity there as well. There's investments in rural, uh, rural Alaska to interject certainty there. For example, PCE, as always, has been funded, and it's, uh, it's funded again this year. And we're looking at building a new school in the Pakiak. And uh, we've got money for, uh, for the Reeds Act that also helps uh, rural Alaska as well. We have $117 million for Village Safe Water. Broadband office has been stood up to add certainty to uh, what we're doing in the state of Alaska. Um, and in the end, we save a lot of money. We save a lot of money for the future. We save a lot of money for a potentially an uncertain future. We don't know what the price of oil is going to be, but the amount of money that we have in savings, the amount of money we have in our endowments, um, uh, we believe that uh, we would be able to fund another year of government, even if the price of oil went down in the 30s or high 20s. So in the end, we think this is a great budget for the state of Alaska. We have reduced uh, spending in this budget, uh, $400 million roughly, 
Oil credits are paid off, so they're certainly there. That's off the books. Again, uh, we've increased our borrowing power. Uh, went from $300 million in 2019 to $1.35 billion in terms of the ability to, do, uh, to uh, float bonds. Our credit rating has improved from negative in 2019 to stable or positive. Um, and we kept this with our agency operating side of the budget, with our agencies, at a, uh, lo a level lower than when we came into office, except for the two investments in public safety and education. So I think this is a budget that helps Alaskans now. I think this is a budget that helps Alaskans uh, this coming year. And I think this is a budget that's going to help Alaskans for years to come. We'll continue to budget responsibly. We'll, be, we'll continue to budget in a manner that's consistent with the outcomes that the people of Alaska want and, um, and need. And uh, again, uh, we look forward to planning, uh, planning again for next year and tackling some of the uh, difficult issues that face Alaska on a yearly basis. So with that, I want to thank all of you for coming uh, and spending time here today and explaining what's happening here in the state of Alaska to the people of Alaska. And I want to thank the press for being here, too. So you guys have a great day. Thank you. Wow. Absolutely wow. So the governor just came out with his budget, and he didn't pull out the big red pen for not a single line item. At least he didn't express a single line item there today being cut from the budget. He made it very clear that the special interests are being well taken care of. He left the illegal Ford funding for K-12 through in the budget, uh, which they could have easily passed a uh, law that simply would have stated that the prior year's budget would be the current year's budget for the school district. So until the actual fiscal budget for that year gets passed, assuring the teachers and everybody else that not a single pink slip would ever be delivered. And uh, so that way they would have known that they had the money there, that uh, no matter what, a budget for the school district would actually be passed. And they at least know they have at least a uh, semblance of almost exactly what they had the prior year before. But no, they can't do things simply. They got to make sure that they steal the money. Ironically, what they cut from our PFDs from the budget, the 5,500 to actually 4,400, that would have went to us, not including the rebate check. That $4,400, that money that they cut down to 2550, that $1.2 billion that was forward funded to K through 12, ironically was our cut to our PFD that paid for that. I don't know where he's getting off trying to claim they made a $400 million budget cut to the budget this year. That's another additional lie. This budget grand total, not including local spending and the COVID money that the locals still have to pay for, this is a $19 billion budget. When you get done adding in all the COVID relief that has been passed through directly into the communities and to the school districts, through local spending of the local budgets too, also for the school districts. The grand total being spent this year here in Alaska is $29 billion. Yes, you heard that right, $29 billion. The lies just never end on their side. They just continue over and over and over again. I was really shocked to hear Dave Bronson saying that they're renaming the Port of Alaska, which was renamed under Berkowitz now to become the Don Young, Don Young Port of Alaska. Just another shining example of how corrupt things have really begun. I do find it ironic going into elections that uh, the only people that were disenfranchised was the minority, the same people that the Democrats say that uh, is that uh, Republicans are the ones that are disenfranchising them with our voter reform laws. One of the voter reform laws that was being pushed very heavily in our Senate and the House this year was being able to reconcile votes that had discrepancies on them, like they forgot to sign the signature, they forgot to get a signature verification witness to do it. Something along those lines that, you know, disqualified their vote. 
that was in the election reform bills that the Democrats fought tooth and nail to make sure did not get passed through either the House or the Senate this year. So the bottom line is when you look at who to vote for this coming up year, let's put it out very simply. Anybody that has voted yes for the budget for the last seven years, this year included, needs to be replaced. And the only exception I will give to this is you have absolutely no other choice because there is nobody better than who is already there right now. But if there's a candidate that is better than the ones that they have in there right now, you need to vote them out. One of the things that you also need to be looking at when you go out to vote this year is where do they stand on the PFD? If they say they are for the PFD, as long as it's for a responsible budget, they're not the people to be voting for because they're no different than the same ones that steal our PFDs to pay for government's special interest to keep on being funded, well funded, out there. So like, share this video. Appreciate you guys all being here on this beautiful, beautiful Tuesday afternoon. I'm heading back off to work. I was not planning on being here to live stream this, so hopefully I got a good enough message up on top to be able for everybody to see about what was discussed today in the budget, at least where all the money was spent and who we need to be blaming and who not to be voting for. Like and share this video so all Alaskans can hear and see what our governor has had to say today and those that represent him. You guys all have a great afternoon and I will see you guys all the next time.